Hello and welcome to the EcoCast by Actual Tech Media. Today's topic, transforming education and government IT cloud environments. On the event, you'll hear from our experts from Progress, Rubrik, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, and NetApp. We know that state, local government, and educational institutions have unique IT requirements and regulations that tra traditional commercial organizations just don't face. Uh, you have specific budgeting processes, strict compliance. Uh, public sector organizations are really focused, or I'm sorry, forced to maximize every IT resource in your environment. And so on this event, we'll be covering what you need to do to modernize your IT infrastructure, gain greater efficiency, agility, and performance, while at the same time maximizing your IT investment. So we're here to help get your questions answered. We have our experts uh, speaking on today's event, and we'll be doing dedicated Q&A sessions with each of today's expert presenters. We even have a best question prize to help encourage your questions. Uh, I'll talk about that here in just a moment. Before we get started, there's just a few things that you should know about the event. My name is David Davis of Actual Tech Media, and I'll be serving as the moderator. Uh, as always, we want these events to be educational, and we encourage your questions there in the questions pane of your audience console. We're all former IT professionals ourselves here at Actual Tech Media. We know how tough it can be, and so we really want to help to solve your technology challenges on this event. We encourage you to socialize the event with your peers uh, using Twitter. You can do that there at the bottom of your console using the Twitter icon, and the hashtag for today will be automatically appended. It is ATM Ecocast. If you tweet about the event, uh, it's very likely that I'll be commenting, uh, re retweeting, or following you. So appreciate you doing that in advance. I also want to call your attention there to the handouts tab. It's there that you'll find either PDF uh, resources or special links uh, with additional information on the four different solutions you'll be learning about on today's EcoCast. And then finally, as always on the EcoCast, we've got some great prizes lined up for you. We have three Amazon $500 gift cards. Of course, you must be live in attendance to qualify for the prize drawings. And I will be announcing the winner uh, verbally during the event, just after our Q&A sessions. So make sure that you stay tuned for that. In addition to those three Amazon $500 gift cards, we also have four Amazon $50 gift cards for our best question prizes. So you, you, of course, you have to ask a question to be entered into the prize drawing, and then also meet the actual Tech Media prize terms and conditions, which can be found there in your handouts tab. All grand prizes. All grand prize winners must submit an IRS Form W-9 to Actual Tech Media, and we reach out to the prize winners via email after the event. All prize winners, of course, also have the option to donate your prize value to charity if you win a prize. I, I know some um, specific types of organizations out there don't allow uh, prizes, and we would love to help you donate that prize to someone less fortunate. We partnered with the charities there that you see on the screen and over the years, we've donated thousands of dollars to charity. So if you win a prize and you'd like to do that, we would love to help you out. Uh, we also, as I mentioned, encourage you to socialize the event. The hashtag on Twitter is ATM Ecocast. You can follow Actual Tech Media on the top right-hand side of your audience console there using the Twitter icon. And me, of course, your moderator as well, David M. Davis. Subscribe to all the Actual Tech Media channels, YouTube, Facebook, and our 10 on Tech podcast. You'll see the YouTube icon on the top right-hand side of your audience console. It's there on our YouTube channel that we post recordings of all of our events, so make sure that you subscribe to that. And then we post all of our latest and greatest content over on LinkedIn, so make sure that you follow us there as well. And again, you can do that on the top right-hand side of your audience console using the LinkedIn icon. Finally, I want to call your attention to the Handouts tab. It's there that you'll find a link to the gorilla.guide website where you can download free, easy to read enterprise IT books authored by top industry experts. And then one final way to win a prize on the EcoCast today is you can refer your IT friends or coworkers to Actual Tech Media's online events and you both could win an Amazon $300 gift card. We do that gift card drawing each month. So you'll find a link to that there in the handouts tab where it says refer an industry friend. Or at the end of the event, you'll be automatically redirected to the landing page where you can refer your IT friends. And with that, 
I'm excited now to bring in today's keynote presenter. Welcome, Mr. Scott D. Lowe, CEO and co-founder of Actual Tech Media, as well as a former CIO at a higher educational institution. Scott, take it away. Hi there, I'm Scott Lowe with Actual Tech Media and thank you for joining us for today's event. Before we get started with our great lineup of speakers today, I wanna to talk a little bit about education and government 2022 priorities brought to you by some leading organizations in their space that analyze these vertical market spaces. There are a number of places that outline the priorities in the government education landscapes, but there's two that really stand out. That's NACIO as well as EDUCAUSE. NACIO is the National Association of State Chief Information Officers and EDUCAUSE is the predominant educational uh, foundation, uh, a nonprofit that helps support higher education institutions. They control the .edu domain name space and they provide great content to help IT and college leaders do better and understand what their peers are doing and what's really coming down the pike that's important for them to keep an eye on. Let's start with NACIO. They recently released their 2022 strategies, policy issues, and management processes list, things that are gonna be important to state CIOs in the coming months. As you can see on your screen, there are 10 things that are critical. Number one should not be a surprise, cybersecurity and risk management. You can't turn on a TV or a screen anywhere today without hearing about the latest ransomware attack, for example. Also, digital government and digital services. In this space, we're really thinking about things like digital transformation, a focus on the constituent experience. How can we make things better? How can we make government more accessible? And to that end, broadband and wireless connectivity are critical issues for state CIOs as well, not just for their own agencies, but also in their states. There are still a lot of areas of the country that suffer from poor broadband, which gives them a significant economic disadvantage that a lot of states don't wanna see. Obviously cloud services, they're always gonna be here at this point, um, are on the list. How can governments do better in terms of cloud adoption in a strategic way? Legacy modernization. When we think about government, unfortunately, a lot of times we think about being in the past. You know, we, we hear about, you know, the IRS still using mainframes and, you know, old systems and all that stuff. And that's really, you know, there's some truth to that. It can be hard to upgrade some of these older systems, not just because there's not necessarily money there, but because the systems that are in place are so critical that any disruption can be, well, pretty catastrophic. But over time, these organizations are gonna to have to figure out ways to bring these older systems to modern specifications. And this is where the, the legacy modernization piece of this comes into play. And who are you and what do you want? Identity and access management. This is really critical for government services, especially if we think about things that have to be more secure, where we have to have IDs um, that we show for certain things. You know, I don't know if we'll ever get to a point where we have fully online voting, but that's gonna require a significant identity and access management framework to work. Number seven is workforce. And this is one that I think is really important in both the college side as well as the government side. You know, the last couple of years have shown us that the workforce is far more fluid than anyone ever thought it would be. We see, you know, what we're terming the great resignation taking place across industries across, around the world. People are looking for different ways to work, different ways to live. And as CIOs, whether you're in a college environment, an educational environment, or a, or a government environment at any level, you're going to be facing issues of having to re try to retain your workforce. And this is going to be something that is on the minds of CIOs everywhere as we move forward, especially in places where it can already be hard to find talent at a competitive price um, when we have a lot of organizations in these two spaces um, that don't always have the ability to pay what might be considered market wages. NACIO also outlines enterprise architecture as a key priority for 2022. And this is basically a top-down look at how entities work, how agencies work, how state governments work. And this is something that everywhere, all of you, regardless of what your role is, you'll play a part in your organization's enterprise architecture. And this is something that people are gonna have to think about more holistically than they may have in the past. And we can't overlook data and information management either. As we look at increasing privacy needs, compliance requirements, and all across the spectrum in different places, we're gonna to have to have a better handle on what we're storing and why we're storing it. And data and information management will continue to play a pretty prevalent role in IT organizations, probably 2022 and forever beyond. 
And finally, consolidation and optimization. You know, we've gone through these cycles in the past of consolidation and trying to make things better. And over, you know, what happens is at one end of the pendulum, you start to, you know, do something like you have lots of physical service that you're deploying. And eventually we consolidate and optimize on things like VMware. Now we see cloud services doing the same thing. And we're going to start to see consolidation and optimization in cloud services, security services, all the services that we use in government um, to try to make things more streamlined, more secure, and more cost efficient. On the higher ed side of the screen, you know, talk about cyber everywhere. Are we prepared? Well, when, with cyber everywhere comes a need for increased security. Now this also, in addition to security, goes to having the ability to teach students wherever they may be. And this became particularly important during the pandemic when we had a lot of students that were undertaking virtual learning. So we had to be able to have the ability to support them everywhere, but still in a secure way. And we had to find ways to be prepared. Um, but are we prepared for this on an ongoing basis as we look at new modalities for teaching and learning in the coming years? And colleges everywhere are constantly facing this question. How do we evolve so we don't become extinct? And technology plays a significant role in this, an increasing role in this over time. What are we going to do to help our organizations thrive in an incredibly competitive space? In order to thrive, we have to have faculty and staff that truly understand and embrace technology. And this is where digital faculty for a digital future come into play. Do we have faculty with the right skill set and the right mindset to really tackle complex technology challenges that may help them move their organizations forward? One of the things I love about higher ed is we always want to look inward and figure out how we can learn from what we've done. And when we talk about COVID, there's a lot of lessons here. And this is number four on the list, learning from COVID-19 to build a better future. What lessons can we take away from the last two years to make our environments even stronger than they were prior to COVID? Then we have the digital versus brick and mortar balancing game. It relates to needs around making sure that we have entities that can support both business and education, regardless of where people happen to be. And that means that we might want to have the ability to teach virtually for a class or hybrid for another class, uh, have people that are working anywhere, working from home, working from, you know, an island somewhere in the Pacific. Digi from digital scarcity to digital abundance. If you really think about, obviously, technology today, um, there's more content than you can possibly consume. And it didn't used to be that way. And at the same time, we also have people who may not have always had an, a, a deep understanding of technology, but today that's changing across uh, the higher ed landscape. We have people who have digital skills, we have a plethora of services, but how do we bring them to bear for the best interest of the institution? And this is gonna be a key question for IT leaders in higher education in 2022 and beyond. As we look at the demographics around the country, there are fewer students than there were just a few years ago. This is a, a, a known demographic shift that's gonna change over time, but right now we have institutions that are fighting for a smaller pool of students. And we're seeing more and more closures, more mergers um, among institutions. And this also means that we have or, you know, colleges that need to be more um, competitive. And if you have the right people in the right place at the right time, this presents an incredible opportunity for advancement that we may not have had at any point in the, in the past. And I think that when we look at the challenges in front of higher ed, uh, when we start to think about how technology can help solve those challenges, really the sky's the limit. And again, the cloud, weathering the shift to the cloud, there's a lot of organizations, a lot of colleges that are still skeptical, um, although that skepticism is eroding um, you know, quickly year over year. And again, can we learn from the crisis, from a crisis? What can we learn from the crisis that was COVID-19? Um, and, and really any crisis, I mean, we have climate change. What can we learn from all of these things? Or when we got hit by, if we got hit by ransomware, um, you know, how do we look back and try to take positive lessons from all of the crises that have taken place or that are con continuing to take place to build a better organization? Then we have this concept of radical creativity. How do we unleash technology forces to help colleges and universities thrive. And I think that's something that there's, those are environments that are provide an incredible opportunity for the people in those, uh, those organizations to help move their organizations forward. Thank you very much and enjoy today's event. 
great presentation. Thank you so much, Scott, for your insight there. Uh, I really learned a lot. I know the audience did as well. Uh, we just brought up our first poll question on the screen that says, what's your time frame for adding new or updating IT solutions at your company? So Scott talked about you know, the top 22, 2022 priorities for public sector organizations. And you know, the question here is simply, what's your time frame to take some sort of action? Uh, is it in the next uh, six months, six to 12 months? or 12 to 24 months, or maybe you're not quite sure at this point. So we appreciate your feedback on this poll. If you haven't answered the polls before on these events, you just do it right there in the slides window. Select the option that corresponds to you and your company. And we'll have other polls throughout the event. And of course, we always appreciate your feedback on our polls. It gives uh, our presenters and us at Actual Tech Media here some insight into your thoughts and feedback. All right, thank you to everyone who responded there to the poll. It's time now to kick off the EcoCast with our first presenter. I'm excited now to introduce Mr. Mark Taller, Senior Product Marketing Manager at Progress. Mark, it's great to have you on. Thanks very much. It's good to be here. Excellent. Well, take it away. Thank you. So as mentioned, uh, my name is Mark Teller. I'm a senior product marketing uh, manager, but really more of a product expert here at Progress. And uh, my focus is on a tool called What's Up Gold, which I will get to in a minute. But what we really want to do is talk to you today about how we're seeing transformation uh, in network monitoring and IT solutions for both education and government agencies. Uh, historically, What's Up Gold's actually been uh, very strong in those industries, so we're very much aware of what's happening to the organizations that are either operating schools or universities or school boards uh, and the various government agencies out there as well. Uh, and they've got some specific uh, unique uh, requirements. Um, very quickly, I'm going to go over some of the challenges uh, for those uh, organizations. We're going to look at uh, five best practices um, that we've determined are really helping our customers. Uh, and we're going to go into a little detail, of course, on how What's Up Gold specifically can help that. And just so you know, it's not vaporware, I'm going to give you some actual examples before we stop for a little Q&A. So <clears throat> this list could look a little generic, um, but there are some specific and unique uh, challenges that face both government uh, agencies and educational organizations. Um, and the two big ones are uh, budget and uh, compliance. Everyone's under tight budgets, that's standard, but uh, with government and with education, um, you're really working on shoestrings. Uh, I think Scott mentioned uh, talking about uh, old legacy equipment that hasn't been replaced in 20 or 30 years. Um, that's not at all uncommon, and you often find these organizations have IT teams or sometimes even just IT individuals who are being tasked regularly with doing more with less. Uh, and as mentioned with COVID, we've seen an explosion of remote work, an explosion of video, the introduction of uh, Teams and Zoom that are just absolutely consuming bandwidth. Uh, and that's creating a whole bunch of new challenges, especially when there hasn't been a budget for new equipment or new people. Um, the other piece, of course, is compliance. And again, individual organizations in other industries may or may not have specific uh, compliance requirements, but there are ones that apply specifically to government and to a lesser extent to education um, that they have to comply with. And not only do they have to comply with those regulations, they have to show that they're meeting them and they have to be able to prove that they're meeting them because the consequences for doing that are absolutely dire. Uh, and again, that's a big challenge, which again is uh, simply compounded by the issue of working with uh, lesser budgets and older equipment. The rest of it is stuff that honestly is going to challenge any organization. We're seeing a bit more of it specifically uh, within uh, governments and educational uh, organizations simply because of the you know, nature of those uh, industries. Um, virtual media, or sorry, virtual uh, machines. Um, everyone's got virtualized uh, tracking where those uh, virtual machines are, what uh, their physical associations are, um, where that bandwidth is going, what they're doing, that's key. Um, media being slow and streaming, uh, end users complaining that their uh, Zoom uh, sessions are choppy or breaking up, constant issue. Uh, and a hard one to diagnose is that the problem with the remote individual somewhere at the sticks with a you know, poor ISP and a poor connection, or is that something wrong with your network and how do you figure that out? Um, 
related to that is measuring the bandwidth utilization, uh, which really comes down to a single question of you know, what happened to all of my bandwidth? Where is it all going? Um, being able to figure that out, especially in an educational organization where often you have students or um, you know, individual uh, educators who aren't necessarily doing the same kind of thing as everyone else uh, and are more likely to you know, maybe stop for lunch and watch 4K videos from Netflix, uh, you know, which the system wasn't necessarily designed for. You know, that's where you want to have a better understanding of what's going on with that. And then, of course, how do you figure all of this out and you know, how do you compile all this information? Um, if you're getting information from multiple different monitoring tools and you have too many consoles to check out, that is severely going to degrade your performance, your ability to diagnose errors and to fix them. And that's a key issue. Um, and then finally, and this is kind of cross-purpose to the uh, budgetary issue I brought up uh, recently, but, but it's not really when you think about it. Um, one of the things that you always want to be doing is looking at whether or not you have underutilized resources. Um, are there unnecessary virtual machines? Do we have more bandwidth available that we're not using at certain times? Can we uh, offload some of these recurring issues to off hours? That sort of information. If we can decommission certain machines or if we can uh, replace uh, certain systems, that can result in either uh, an easier environment for IT to manage or it can result in cost savings. And, and just to give you an example of that, a, a classic one that we've seen was um, there was no budget to replace a bunch of servers uh, in, in one uh, educational organization we knew. And they were quite old, they were buggy, they were difficult to maintain. Um, but the company that made them had almost the identical item in half the form factor. And one of, our, of the IT guys did the math and said, look, we can replace an entire rack of servers with half a rack of the new ones if we buy them. Um, and yeah, it's going to cost a little bit of money, but here's the savings in the cooling and power. And that made up the budget shortfall. So being aware of that and understanding how to make those changes and understanding what those devices are can really make a difference in terms of not only you know, getting newer equipment if you need to under the budget, uh, but finding out where the inefficiencies are and how you can fix them. So with that said, let's take a look at some of the best practices that we've noticed. And the number one uh, best practice, and, and, and really this isn't even a best practice, this is table stakes. You've got to discover your infrastructure. If you can't find it, you can't monitor it, and you can't manage it. Your, uh, your network is a living, breathing thing that is constantly changing. And whether those changes are planned or, or unplanned doesn't matter. If you don't know what is running, what's connected, uh, what's dependent on what something else is, where those items are, and in what locations they are, you're just setting yourself up for failure. Um, the first thing you need to do is a layer two or three discovery that will figure out what's connected to my network and map it out so you can see exactly where those items are. Um, how something is connected is going to be half the time the answer as to why it's not working properly or why it's slow. So that's absolutely table stakes. Figure out what's going on. And then monitor that infrastructure. All right. The discovery is a snapshot. It's going to show you what's going on right at the moment you take that snapshot. It can change in 24 hours. It could change in two. It could change in 10 minutes. Uh, or it can stay stable for the next month or so. You're not going to know unless you're regularly monitoring the health and the availability and the performance of everything. And that's both wired and wireless, and I'm including cloud devices. Uh, anything that's connected is something that you should be able to monitor. So whether those are servers, cloud resources, load balancers, uh, specific applications, um, all of your virtual resources, it's really essential to understand what's going on on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. And, and most importantly, you want to be able to see everything in context. Um, Every piece of equipment that uh, you purchase or every service that you purchase um, is going to have some form of management uh, tool, which is great, except now you're going through 15 different consoles trying to find the answer, and everything's finger pointing at everything else. You know, the Meraki system says it's the AWS server. The uh, AWS server says it's the uh, uh, Hyper-V system. You don't necessarily know. What you need is something that can show all of these systems how they interrelate and show them all in context. Because you know, 
in fairness, the Cisco management system is not necessarily designed to tell you what's going on with your Microsoft Azure cloud services. You know, it's, it's not its primary role. You want something that can show all of this. And using one tool is going to make a huge, huge difference. If it's all on one console, it's going to eliminate that finger pointing, and it's going to make it easier to diagnose issues and improve your mean time to repair. And this is a subtle difference, but I just said monitoring the infrastructure. You also need to monitor the traffic, both on your wired and wireless systems. Uh, and this is where it comes down to answering that question of what happened to all of my bandwidth. Um, where is your bandwidth going? Which users are consuming the bandwidth? And more importantly, why? You know, I, I mentioned the example of someone you know playing a 4K video from or streaming 4K video from Netflix. That may be completely legitimate if it's a documentary that a teacher is showing in a classroom, or if it's something that's uh, you know, being used for an advertisement and people are, are showing it. There's a variety of reasons why people could be using massive amounts of bandwidth. You need to figure out which ones are legitimate, uh, and then figure out how to optimize your systems so that you can make sure that they are getting the bandwidth they need, uh, and you're getting alerted when they aren't getting the bandwidth they need. Um, I won't pitch monitoring tools as a security tool, but honestly, honestly, the first notification usually that you're likely to be experiencing a DDoS attack is when your bandwidth starts to suffer. And if you're getting alerts when your bandwidth starts dropping or when there's congestion or there's latency issues, that's one of the first things that's going to twig you to the fact that, hey, you could be possibly under attack. So just something else to consider there. But this is, again, why it's absolutely essential to monitor the traffic on that infrastructure that you're monitoring. And this one's very much specific. Again, general for all industries, but this one particularly applies to um, educational and government organizations that are trying to do more with less. Um, automate everything. Um, compliance is a major issue, uh, and that means that you're going to want your network devices, especially routers and servers, uh, configured in a particular way that doesn't violate any of the or, uh, regulatory compliance requirements that you may very well be working under. And, and this is key because you know, if someone adds a router or changes a router and says, okay, no, I'll allow traffic on you know, port 8080 for whatever reason, that could very well be a violation of your compliance. And that's going to be a problem if you ever get audited or if you have to later show that, hey, no one ever had access. If you've got a solution that will not only monitor all of those compliances, but automatically apply them every time you configure a new router, every time you add a new router, every time you move something, it can automatically ensure that it is configured the way you need it to be configured. And it's not a matter of you got to go down through a checklist or you know, determine exactly how that a specific system or device is uh, uh, configured. It's all stored, it's all saved, it can all be applied. And if something changes, again, you can get an alert. Uh, and if you want to be really paranoid, you can automatically revert that. Um, again, anything gets changed, it's a matter of one click to revert it back to its original um, setup. Uh, setup. You can also put the old and the new setup side by side so you can see exactly what got changed. Uh, and again, if you know, you've got a hard and fast uh, rule that you know, no traffic on port 8080, for example, uh, anytime that changes, you can automatically revert it. We know uh, that uh, we, we know from our customers that somewhere north of 60% of network problems are due to misconfigured uh, devices. And if you can automate the configuration for all those devices, it's going to save you a lot of time and help make you more compliant. And I mentioned consolidation before, but this is also another key item. Um, being uh, in IT can be very much like working in a car alarm factory. There's always something screaming for your attention. Um, if you've got 15 different consoles and they are all uh, alerting you to something, uh, even if they're the same item, you're not necessarily going to know, uh, and you're not necessarily going to be able to prioritize. You want to consolidate all of the alerts for anything going wrong with your network, um, no matter where it's occurring, all on one console, all through one system, so you can see what's going on. This also, by the way, allows you to uh, resolve issues with dependencies. So if, for example, you've got uh, one server and there's 15 other servers downstream, and that one server goes down, well, you're going to get 16 items screaming at you and saying, you know, we've got a problem. Uh, you want something that's smart enough to say, no, 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 ignore those other 15. This is the one that's important because they're not connected because it's not connected. That's a huge time saver. 
Um, and, and these alerts need to be something that you can control. Uh, however, the best way uh, it is for your organization, your group, your IT team to deal with these alerts, um, you want those alerts to come in that way. It could be a text, it could be email, it could be a web pop-up uh, right in front of you. Um, or uh, if uh, there's a group of you uh, and maybe someone's on vacation, maybe you're on vacation, you're not there to answer the alert, uh, or maybe it's not your shift, you know, have it come in through a group organization like or a group tool like Slack or uh, Teams. And that way, uh, if you're busy or you're in a meeting or not around, someone else can pick it up and resolve it so you're not looking at something going down for three days because no one noticed because that person wasn't at their desk. The whole advantage of this is it's going to allow you to get alerts for everything that goes wrong, whether it's a traffic bottleneck, bandwidth issue, hardware issue, a configuration change, some other form of performance problem, you're going to get alerted on it. And usually, before it starts impacting your end users, which is huge. If you can fix a problem before it impacts the end users, that is the holy grail of IT. And that's not me making that up. We've got a customer who says that all the time. The goal here is to increase efficiency. And if you put all of your alerts in one place, it's going to make you more efficient. And finally, reporting is key. And some of this comes right down to you know, being able to prove that you're compliant. Uh, you're always going to have to be able to pull up a report saying here's you know, how our systems are configured, uh, here's how we're proving we're compliant with uh, whatever regulation I'm, I'm dealing with. I'm being purposely vague. There's, there's tons of regulations that may or may not affect everyone. Um, but if you've got a system that is doing all of this and can automatically spew out a report, that is worth its weight in gold. You can set up weekly, hourly reports if you want that automatically go out through email or it can be automatically printed. Um, uh, or you, know, you can even set up a live link where anyone who wants to can just click on a link and see in real time exactly what the status is of, say, bandwidth or compliance or configurations or whatever you want. Um, they're, they're really, there's hundreds of different options uh, that come out of the box, or it's very easy to create your own reports and your own dashboards. Um, one of the big advantages of this is not only does it make it very easy to prove compliance uh, and provide things like real-time asset inventory and, and compliance reports, but it also really proves the value of IT. Um, most of you are probably aware that IT tends to be the red-headed stepchild organization within uh, a any uh, industry. Uh, if everything is working fine, why do we need to pay for IT? If everything's broken, well, why are we paying IT? Because everything's broken and they're not doing their job. Um, it's a constant battle. Um, you're constantly doing things, and the end users and the management never seem to notice. Well, if you've got a reporting system that's letting them know every week, hey, these are the attacks we repelled. Uh, these are the configuration changes that we reverted so that they didn't uh, cost us uh, you know, massive fines uh, for uh, being out of compliance. Uh, these are the uh, major bandwidth uh, savings that we were able to do. Uh, here's the uh, 10 people who are uh, trying to watch a streaming video that we shut off immediately so that uh, um, you, Mr. CEO, could uh, have your Zoom meeting. That kind of information not only uh, lets everyone else in the organization know what you're doing, but also raises your profile and lets people know, yeah, these guys are doing a lot. Um, that can be really, really valuable when it comes to trying to negotiate budgets and saying we can't do more with less. You know, we need new servers. We need another warm body. We need uh, better monitoring software. So those are the kind of six best practices um, that we find work best. Um, obviously, we have a dog in this hunt, so I'm going to be fairly straightforward and make it clear that everything I just described is something that you can do with What's Up Gold, which is a network availability and performance at a glance monitoring solution. Um, this is well established. We've been around for quite some time. We're very popular. Um, we're Easy, easy, easy to use. The uh, main value of What's Up Gold, quite frankly, is to find and fix problems fast. It is a diagnostic tool that allows you to see what's happening in your network, to get alerted uh, in any way you want to any issues, and hopefully resolve them before your end users notice. Um, it's something that's completely vendor agnostic. We can show you everything in context. Uh, and we can make it very, very easy for you to stay on top of your network and what's going on with it.
What specifically can you monitor with WhatsApp Gold? Uh, it's easy to say what can't you monitor. You can monitor your devices, look for things like uh, interface utilization, system servers, workstations. Um, are they uh, using their memory, their storage? Uh, are they running into capacity issues? Um, all of your cloud resources, whether it's AWS or Azure, you can monitor those servers, the storage devices, other uh, cloud resources like uh, load balancers even you can monitor, uh, and how they're interacting with the rest of your network. Um, we talked, uh, or at least Scott, I believe, mentioned talking about uh, older systems as well. Uh, when you're babying older hardware, you need to pay more attention to things like fans and power supplies, and are those things starting to overheat? Are they starting to wear out? Um, are we looking at potential hardware failures? Uh, similarly, with virtual resources, easy to spin up a virtual server, a lot harder to remember what you did with it, whether it's being used, uh, what uh, physical device it's on, how much CPU, how much memory that thing is using. Uh, is that thing uh, something that was sp uh, spun up for training uh, a year ago and no one's used it since and doesn't need to be there anymore? That's exactly the sort of thing that you can determine with a tool like that's so gold. And then finally, wireless. Uh, you know, are you getting adequate bandwidth? Are you getting adequate signal strength? Do you need to deploy additional uh, um, wireless access points or just move the ones you have? These are all questions you can answer with what's up there. So having said all of that, I know you're sitting back there going, okay, that's great, Mark, but you know, is this all vaporware or is it real? Well, let me give you a couple of examples. Um, Here's a, uh, a mid-sized municipality in Southern California, uh, the city of Pleasanton. Um, they've been a WhatsApp Gold customer for some time. Uh, and of course, they are subject to a number of different regulations, as well as having the same problems that any organization has of keeping the network up and running. Um, they were actually a, a beta tester for our relatively recent log management uh, capability that we've added to WhatsApp Gold. Uh, and they liked it so much, they demanded an extended license uh, until they could actually put together a uh, um, purchase order, uh, which you know, being a municipality took them a while. Um, they found that not only are they using WhatsApp Gold to keep track of every single device, every single system and server, um, including mission critical ones like police and fire and ambulance uh, that they're uh, related to, but also uh, they were finding that the log management solution was alerting them to various log errors that they wouldn't have noticed in any other way. Um, they had a misconfigured uh, server that uh, did not have permissions to access uh, one particular uh, application and it was constantly pinging. So there was bandwidth being eaten up, there was a potential failure going on there, and there's no way they would have known about that uh, until either it broke or until they uh, uh, noticed uh, the uh, um, log management alerts in the log management system. And you know that was the sort of thing that made them say, no, that's it, we need this, we want this. Uh, and like all of our customers, their goal is responding faster to problems uh, and being able to see all of the alerts at one point and resolve issues before they start impacting people like you know, the 911 system, for example, or the uh, police dispatch system. A uh, school board example uh, is the uh, um, Danville area school board, uh, or school district rather. Um, this one's a slightly older one, but uh, at the uh, tail end of 2019, uh, as COVID lockdowns uh, hit, they found themselves having to plan for remote learning. Um, and they were fortunate that they'd been rolling out uh, laptops to all of their students and uh, their teachers. And they took the summer break to develop, um, frankly, a really impressive uh, remote teaching system. Uh, they pretty much set up every single uh, one of their teachers with a full studio um, that they could use in the classroom or take home if they had to quarantine. Uh, it included you know, webcams, uh, Zoom capabilities, uh, projectors and projector cams, uh, and uh, as well as document cams. And the idea was whether the kids were in the classroom or at home, they'd be able to see the exact same thing, have the same level of interaction, uh, and the teacher could teach as normal uh, and uh, display that information to everyone. In fact, they even uh, leveraged it at one point uh, when they were running short of substitute teachers which is a major issue, uh, that uh, they had one teacher who was teaching two classes, the other was across the hall, and they just had a warm body adult in there to make sure the kids weren't goofing off, that they could do the same class in, in multiple areas. All of this required a ton of additional equipment. Um, all of, uh, it also required a ton of additional bandwidth and a lot of flexibility. And what's up gold is the key to, making, to allowing them to be able to implement all of this. Every single one of those new devices they were able to monitor to ensure that uh, if it was having problems or if it was failing or if it went down, they could respond immediately. Similarly, um, bandwidth. Uh, if uh, any uh, teacher or any school or any uh, child, any class ever uh, started to have bandwidth issues, they could usually see the problem coming and resolve it before it started impacting things. 
The result was a completely seamless transition to both remote and to hybrid learning. Um, they're in a situation right now where they don't even care whether or not the student or the teacher is in the school. They can still get the same education and still get them the same information. It's really quite impressive. Um, and if you care, we've got a much longer uh, webinar we did uh, about a year ago that goes into all of this in tremendous detail. So these are solutions that are actually working. They're working in the field. They're working for educational organizations. They're working for um, municipalities and other governmental organizations. We've done this. We can help. Um, and uh, if you've got any questions, I'll be more than happy to go into them. Absolutely, yeah. Great presentation, Mark. We do have some questions for you coming in here from the audience. Uh, while we take those questions, I'm just going to bring up a poll for everyone out there uh, that says, what additional information would you like about the Progress Software Solution? Of course, specifically today, we're talking about what's up. So, um, Mark, let's see. First question I wanted to ask you here. This is a good one. Uh, Rob is asking if you can provide any sort of high-level common you know, return on, uh, return on investment example that uh, customers use to justify the cost of what's up gold to senior management? That's a really, really good question. Um, the cost of what's up gold is going to vary depending on the size of your network. We, we price by device effectively. So if you have 15 devices you want to monitor, that's a completely different price than you know, if you have 300. Um, in general, it's actually a little bit easier, we find, for both government and educational organizations to justify this cost um, simply because of the massive fines and the massive costs of being out of compliance. Uh, if you can prove that uh, you are able to resolve issues, improve your uh, mean time to repair, and simply keep everything compliant, that makes a big, big difference. If you're sitting here saying, I need let's say five to $10,000 to justify the software expenditure. And we get a $20,000 fine for every single one of these compliance violations. And this will help prevent that from ever happening. That should be a pretty good pitch uh, to a, a pretty strong argument to get something implemented. Um, and we'd be more than happy, of course, to have our you know, SEs and, and our team help walk you and your bosses through. If you need help putting together an actual ROI, we'd be happy to help out with that. But honestly, we're not, th this is not IBM level um, expensive. I, I don't want to give price ranges, obviously, because everything is different. But our solutions can start as low as $2,000, and you know, our average sale tends to be in the ten dollars to $20,000 range. Uh, again, don't quote me on that because they can obviously go up depending on what you're trying to do. But we're not talking, you know, break the bank sort of uh, costs. This is something that's quite reasonable uh, considering the amount of time and uh, potential expense uh, that uh, it, it can spare. Um, we often say this in other organizations as well. When your network goes down, how much money are you losing? And depending on your organization, it can be anywhere from you know, hundreds of dollars to a minute to hundreds of thousands of dollars a minute. But these days, especially with people working remotely, if the network's down, no one's working. What's that costing you? And if you can prevent that, what's that worth? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Great points all around there. Um, let's see. Another question here. They're wanting to know what, what's it take to get started with this? Is there a free trial? What's the best way to kind of take this for a test drive? There's two really easy ways. The, the simplest way is just go to whatsupgold.com and on every single page is a big red free trial button. Hit that and you can download a free trial. It's got every single feature, every single capability. Um, I think supports up to 2,500 devices. It might be 5,000. I can't recall now. Um, but it's tons. And you can download it, install it. It installs in less than half an hour. It will, the first thing it will do is discover your entire network, and then you're in and you can start playing with it. It's very easy to use. If you don't want to bother with that, you can also go to whatsupgold.com. And on the menu there, there's a resources tab. Uh, there's an interactive demo under that tab, and you can click on it, and you can play with What's Up Gold. It's all web-based, uh, and you can play with a live version of it right there and get a good look at it, get a feel for it, figure out, see for yourself how easy it is to use, see how everything's mapped, um, get an idea. And uh, if you have more questions, you can uh, either download a free trial from there or get in touch with us. Very nice. Yeah, it sounds like it's super easy to get started. Uh, I know, I mean, I used What's Up Gold uh, many, many years ago. Always, it's always been a great product. So it uh, sounds like it could help a lot of folks out here, especially in public sector 
uh, organizations. Uh, I'm afraid we've run out of time here in our live Q&A session, but I, I see about 20 other questions for you there in the electronic queue, Mark. Maybe you can get back to some of those folks. Uh, but we really appreciate Absolutely. your presentation. I, I, no problem. Uh, we'll uh, take those questions and we will respond to you guys all individually via email. Thanks very much. And uh, feel free to uh, visit whatsupgold.com if uh, other questions come up to you. You can always reach out to us and contact us there and we will get back to you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mark. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. And for more information on What's Up Gold, check out the Handouts tab. There is a What's Up Gold Total Plus Edition uh, product brief there that you can download in PDF format and check it out for additional information after the event. And of course, as Mark said, there is a free trial and a number of great ways to get started and take this for a spin. Uh, we appreciate your feedback there on the, the poll question. And I'll leave that up while I announce our first Amazon $500 gift card winner. This is going out to Ramsey Okuma from Nevada. Congratulations, Ramsey Okuma from Nevada. We've got two more gift cards still to give out on the EcoCast today. So make sure that you stay tuned for those. All right, and with that, it's now time to move on to our next presentation on today's EcoCast. I'm excited now to bring in Byron Landers, Senior Sales Engineer at Rubric. Byron, great to have you on. Take it away. All right, thank you, thank you. And thank, thanks to everyone for joining us today. Wanted to uh, spend a short time uh, today talking to you about Rubric and uh, ransomware remediation and what we bring to the game and, and data protection. So we'll get started. We're talking to our customers uh, every day. You know, ransomware is, is prevalent uh, in the news, and that is top of mind for a lot of my customers. Uh, I cover state and local government, and every customer that we talk to, uh, data security is top of mind for them. And things you, you have to consider, and just build this slide out here, you have all the different layers of security uh, in the environment to protect the data from the perimeter, network, endpoint, application, but somehow hackers are still able to penetrate that security and get to your data and hold, hold, it, hold you at ransom for it. So one thing that how rubric changes the game is that we have a data protection product that has cyber resiliency built into the core product. So in addition to what you have protecting your perimeter, network, endpoint, and application, Rubric can guarantee that also the data is protected. And if you get hit with a ransomware event, then we guarantee that you can recover. And we'll talk about how uh, that security is layered uh, in the next few slides here. All right, so let's let's take a, a quick look at today's threat. All right, uh, you get hit with ransomware. Uh, you get a notification that your data has been compromised from the hackers, and they lock down your data. All right, so then it's uh, a decision. Do you pay the ransom, or do you attempt to recover from your backup solution? All right. If you go to the try to attempt to recover from your backup solution, which I'm sure most customers will do as opposed to trying to pay a ransom, then you're going to engage uh, security op teams and they're going to engage IT op, and then you're going to assess if you can determine when you were attacked, what data was attacked, and if you can actually recover. And if the backups have been compromised, which uh, most ransomware uh, hackers are going to try to delete the backups first so you have no way to recover, then you have no choice but to pay the rent. All right? If the backups are safeguarded, then it's a determination of, hey, what, what do I need to recover? Where do I need to recover? And then that's usually, if you don't know that answer already, then that's going to be a long process. So still you're, you're still faced with the end result of, okay, uh, it's going to take too long to recover my core business. I'm going to have to pay the rent. But if you have 
security at the point of data, then you have some different choices if you're hit with a ransomware. Um, you engage IT and security ops in the same fashion to determine, hey, we've been hit with a ransomware event, we need to recover. What can we do? When backups are safeguarded, it's a much different um, outcome because then you can go in, if your backup solution will determine the scope of the attack and also show you what type of sensitive data existed in your environment, then you can recover fast. And more importantly, you can avoid paying that ransom. And that's what the rubric solution provides. And let me build out my slides here. Um, rubric is a modern data protection solution. Um, we took a lot of the legacy uh, architecture and, and rolled it into a single uh, purpose-built hardware appliance uh, that's fully API-driven. Uh, we integrate very nicely with REST API and have a lot of the integrations already pre-built for customers to consume. Um, more importantly, we have an immutable uh, pinned-only file system with logical air gap built into our architecture. It's all sitting behind a zero trust architecture, and that's all designed to protect and safeguard your data. Um, more importantly, if our customers are attacked by ransomware, then we have uh, the product feature, features and functionality in place to determine the scope of the attack, to analyze what type of data may have been impacted, if it was sensitive data. And, and more importantly, we can show you to the file level where you've been impacted. So if you do need to recover, you can recover quickly. And we can guarantee that you can recover and that the, the backup data has not been compromised. We also uh, have API integration into uh, some of the incident response uh, products, SIM and, and SOAR from uh, Palo Alto Network have API integration right into those products so you can to see the analysis and the incident response. And more importantly, uh, we can do instant recovery through our live mount capability. Live mount gives you instant access, uh, near instantaneous access to data uh, using the rubric as a, as a point of, of reference for that data. We, not only do we support that for virtual machines, but we support live mount for SQL and Oracle databases. And our customers absolutely love the, the feature and capability that we have. All right, uh, just the level set, um, let's talk, make sure we um, explain some, some key principles of data protection. Um, three terms that you're gonna hear a lot, air gap, uh, immutability, and zero trust, all right? Air gap, uh, when you don't have air gap, then the backup data, the backup servers, proxies, uh, media servers are all, at, and the, the backup repository, more importantly, are exposed to the network, they're browsable, uh, so ransomware attackers can instantly or immediately access those very, very compromising positions. We have a logical air gap the backup data is, is, uh, is offline, but it's still available uh, for instantaneous recovery. It's just that the backups are not browsable, so hackers cannot browse into or access the, um, the backup file system. Um, also, there's physical air gap, and that, that's a more expensive third copy of the data where it's disconnected from the network for the most part until you need to sync. So there's still some issues with that. Immutability, um, just making sure everyone understands, immutability does not mean your backup cannot be expired. It just means that the backups uh, cannot be edited. When, so if it's mutable, it can be edited. If it's, if it's immutable, then it cannot be edited. But more importantly, the backups can still be expired. So it can't be edited, but they can be expired. And then there's zero trust. Uh, zero trust, uh, traditional, you trust everything, but verify. But in a zero trust, you never trust uh, any protocol, and you always verify uh, by using secure API calls on the back end. How does Rubrik fit into this? 
uh, scenario is that we have the logical air gap uh, natively in the product. Uh, we have native immutability, and we use a zero trust architecture. So those are the, the best of, of best of breed of, of all three. And in that way, we can guarantee that customers can recover their data if they're compromised by a ransomware attack, as well as this creates a, sort of a bunker in a box for, for the rubric um, appliance. So it makes it impenetrable with the logical air gap, the immutable file system right out of the box, and the zero trust architecture. All right. Let's just take a look at, you know, you know how we safeguard backup. You know, traditionally, backups are online, backup proxies, servers, uh, the catalog, everything's exposed. So h hackers can get to that right away and compromise the environment. Go ahead and build that out. Therefore, you are, uh, since the backups can be accessed and modified or deleted so that you have nothing to recover from, uh, then you have no choice but to pay the ransom. There's no, net, no air gap. No native, immutability, no native immutability, and you're vulnerable to a, a major attack is an unrecoverable event. Your only option, pay the ransom, get the decryption key, get your data back. But when you have a solution in place uh, like Rubrik with the zero trust architecture, uh, meaning we trust nothing, uh, not even NTP. We don't even trust the NTP server. Uh, our backups are uh, native air gap. So we're offline, so if a hacker penetrates your endpoint security or perimeter security, they cannot browse or see the backup. And the backups are immutable, uh, so they cannot be modified or encrypted. Lastly, uh, we also secure access to the rubric systems with multi-factor authentication, uh, time-based one-time passwords where you can authenticate to the your uh, user login with uh, authenticator services like uh, Google, Microsoft, Okta, and uh, everything's encrypted in rubric from end to end. So now the major attack is a recoverable event. Not only if you receive a ransomware notification that you've been compromised, rubric can go in and show you to the file level where you've been compromised, where data has been encrypted. And if you need to remediate, you can remediate right from the rubric console uh, because we have the metadata for the backups. We can recover. We have several examples of rubric customers that have been hit with ransomware that have been able to recover 100% from that ransomware event. More importantly, did not have to pay the ransom. And that's uh, and and let me tell you about the uh, the bunker in a box. First and foremost, it's uh, a Linux platform. Uh, it's fully hardened, uh, fully integrated uh, Linux. Uh, we're not using Windows. Uh, you know, some vendors choose to use Windows as a, a core operating system. Very vulnerable to attack. So number one, we have a, a hardened Linux platform. Second, we've talked about the zero trust architecture, end-to-end -end encryption, a mutable file system, and just building out this bunker in a box, the multi-factor authentication, uh, time-based one-time passwords for user authentication. So we're giving, not only are we securing the data, we're securing access to the rubric system, as well as we're adding retention lock uh, on top of that. And that's very important, because remember going through the terminology, a mutable Backups can still be, even if you're immutable, backups can still be expired. But when you add in a feature like retention lock, now not only are your backups immutable, they can't be edited, but also they cannot be expired. And this secures every copy of your data and prohibits reassignment of objects, uh, disable nodes reset, and NTP poisoning, and, and all, all the features uh, that come with uh, retention lock and safeguarding the data. So that is our bunker in a box. Let's go back once. With all of those features, we have an impenetrable um, appliance that's guaranteeing that our customers can always recover. Let's talk about 
how rubric helps accelerate recovery if you are compromised and you have to recover from a ransomware attack. How we, what do we have in place to help accelerate recovery? All right. Number one, we're monitoring your backup systems uh, for anomalies, but, but more we're taking it a step farther because anomalies can be false positives. So we're monitoring the backup system for encryption, uh, deletion, uh, modifications, uh, and, and adding files. And when we see those events in your environment, we are alerting you, sending alerts to our our customers to our end users that, hey, we saw this event. Um, you need to go in and investigate because, you know, it could be nothing happened. Uh, that's a false positive. But if it's uh, an encryption, then it's more than likely a ransomware event. So number, step one is we can identify the blast radius of the attack so that if you need to recover, you know, you can pinpoint to the file level where you need to restore without having to do a full system restore. Step two is to help you assess the risk in your environment. How do we do that? By going out and determining what type of sensitive data uh, exists in your environment and that can be exfiltrated by a ransomware attacker because once they exfiltrate your data, then that's when the ransom goes up. And it can determine that, hey, we have X amount of sensitive data, and if you don't pay the ransom, then we're going to release it. So Rubric can go out through uh, our feature set and identify what sensitive data exists in your environment, and not, and not only identify what sensitive data exists in your environment, we can also show you who has access to the to the data, what type? So who's accessing the data? What type of sensitive data exists in your environment? Step three is when we can optimize and expedite the recovery. Since we know to the file level what's been compromised in your environment, as well as what type of sensitive data exists in your environment, then that can accelerate the the recovery because we we've, we've shown you the blast radius. So in the, in the early example, you know, you get a notification that, hey, we've been hit with ransomware. Uh, we have no idea, number one, that we were hit with ransomware. Number two, we don't know where we were hit. Well, we, Rubrik solved that, that challenge by, you know, showing you what, where you've been compromised, what type of data may have been compromised. And since we have the metadata for your, your backup, we can, um, we can restore to the file level, or if you need to do a mass recovery to quickly restore uh, virtual machines and what have you, then we can also uh, accelerate that. And as we mentioned, we're integrated into uh, uh, SIM and SOAR uh, dashboards uh, for ops and security ops so that you can immediately see uh, risk and threat levels uh, into those products. And we're looking to unify into uh, to more products uh, coming on the road now. All right. So here's just some some customer uh, testimonials that you can actually go out uh, Google these on your own. Um, City of Durham, uh, North Carolina, got hit with a ransomware attack, and ransomware cannot compromise our backups. They were able to quickly restore uh, from that ransomware event. Uh, more importantly, they did not have to pay the ransom. And then just some, some more uh, uh, customer testimonials that you can see from various other rubric customers that have been hit with ransomware and have all been able to recover. And you can definitely go out and Google these stories and you can see the, the full testimonial from these customers on how rubric saved them. And, you know, having a product like rubric, uh, you know, where they were able to quickly restore their operations and not be compromised uh, for ransomware. All right? And just wrapping up here, the, the key to the rubric architecture is zero trust data management. Um, in a modernized platform that's uh, natively air gap, uh, a mutable file system right out of the box, and we're adding that retention lock feature where 
we give you the capability um, to make sure that backups are not modified or deleted. Uh, even though it's immutable, uh, we still need to add that retention lock feature on top so that it can't be modified or deleted because that's what ransomware uh, hackers are trying to do. They delete the backups, then you have no choice but to pay the ransom. But as we've gone through, we've seen that rubric not only has the architecture in place uh, to make sure that you can recover if you're compromised uh, by a ransomware attack to know where you've been compromised, and more importantly, 100% recover the data. And thank you for uh, joining us today. Great presentation, Byron. Oh, we do have some questions you. for you. For Yeah, absolutely. We do have some questions for you from the audience. And so uh, let's see, a lot of great questions coming in. Uh, if you have a question about rubric, now is the time to get it in. Uh, first question I was going to ask you, Byron, they're, they're asking, uh, did you say that rubric has a way to know if your data has been infected with ransomware? Uh, absolutely. Um, we have a, a radar product that's constantly monitoring the backups that come into the system uh, for any type of uh, suspicious event. And if we receive those, uh, if we see those suspicious events, uh, anomalies, uh, encryptions, deletions, modifications, uh, we're going to send an immediate notification to the customer that, hey, uh, we saw this uh, anomaly or encryption on this system, and we'll show you that to the file level. And you can go and investigate if that's a ransomware attack or was it some type of maintenance that was being done by uh, someone on the staff. Uh, another question they're asking, is there a way to, a way to customize uh, the monitoring tool, customize uh, rubric, what's available around that? Absolutely. So uh, as I mentioned, rubric's very API uh, focused. So we integrate very nicely with REST APIs, and we have a, uh, a, a GitHub site. I think it's github.rubric.com, or you can, you can Google uh, rubric GitHub. And a lot of our integrations are already built as well as uh, scripting and, and, and automation uh, scripts or uh, tools are already on our GitHub site that you can actually go out and download the, the full integration and the documentation to, to implement into your environment. Very nice. Um, next question they want to know, um, is there any way to uh, classify the data that's being protected? Uh, not, not presently today, but I know data, for cla data classification is, is one thing that was very high on the, uh, the roadmap. So that should be coming uh, in the near future, but no data, for, no data classification today, but it is something very high on the roadmap. OK. And then next question, does Rubric uh, protect uh, hybrid architectures uh, and applications running on Kubernetes and in the cloud? Absolutely. So in addition to uh, the Rubric CDM product that runs on-premise, uh, we also have a suite of uh, SaaS applications that we make available to our customers um, that are subscription-based. And the, that would include products such as uh, Microsoft 365, um, native VMs that are running inside of uh, public cloud, Azure, uh, AWS, GCP, as well as Q Kubernetes is also available in our software as a service applications. Very nice. And then next question, I'll just kind of sum it up as, hey, I have a backup tool now in place that, that works pretty well. What is it mm -hmm. that really makes Rubrik different that, that's going to make me want to you know, replace what I have? I would, I would say, and I get that question quite a lot, and I would say, hey, you know, being able to guarantee that you can recover from ransomware is top of mind for a lot of my customers that I'm speaking to uh, every day, especially with all the, the news of 
of ransomware events uh, happening and, and taking customers offline. So the one thing that sets Rubrik apart, you know, there are a lot of great backup tools out in the industry today. But one thing that sets us apart is the security. Uh, we talked about the zero trust architecture, the native immutability and logical air gap, uh, being able to guarantee that our customers' data is safeguarded and that if they are compromised from a ransomware attack, 100% guarantee that customers can recover, as well as something we just announced, and this is exciting news, is that we're, we're standing behind our product so much that if we have a customer uh, that is hit with ransomware and cannot recover from it, we're guaranteeing them a warranty of up to $5 million to help pay for the data recovery if they have rubric in place and they can't recover the data. That's impressive. I just saw that on your homepage actually yesterday. So that's a very exciting, uh, cool new announcement available from Rubrik is this ransomware guarantee, ransomware recovery guarantee. So uh, I encourage everyone to learn more about that. Uh, Byron, I'm afraid that's all the time we have here in our live Q&A session. There's a number of more technical questions for you there in the electronic queue. Maybe you can follow up on a great presentation. Thank you for being on. All right, thank you for having me. Thanks, everyone. I've just brought up the poll question for everyone out there that says, what additional information would you like about the rubric solution? And of course, we appreciate your feedback there on the poll. Uh, I can see we've got at least 20 uh, plus questions uh, coming in here for rubric. And so uh, we appreciate those, of course. And Byron, we'll have to get back to you here after the event. We didn't have time in our live event slot, but we really appreciate those questions, some really great questions. If you had a question and it didn't get answered, uh, I think a personal demo would probably be ideal for you. If you check the box there on the poll, it says personal demo, uh, or go out to rubric.com, and of course they can get you set up with a personal demo there as well. We will give the feedback here from the poll to uh, Byron over at Rubric, and I'll give everyone a moment there to respond to the poll, and then I'll be introducing you here to our next presenter from HPE on today's EcoCast. All right, excellent feedback there on the poll. Thank you so much. It's now time to move on to our next presentation on today's EcoCast. I'm excited now to bring in Ryan Brooks, Senior Solution Business Manager at Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Ryan, it's great to have you on. Take it away. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Ryan Brooks. I am the Solution Business Manager here at Hewlett Packard Enterprise uh, Storage. Uh, today, we're going to talk to you about unleashing your cloud everywhere. And this is really driven by our HPE storage organization. And we'll talk a little bit about our new data services cloud console. So let's jump right in. All right. So let's reimagine your data your data experience. And it's really broken down into five core areas. Data creates an experience touching everyone across the organization from IT to database managers to developers. And customers are really telling us they need that data to help their businesses and to drive innovation faster at that. And there's a couple of things that they really point out to us and we've highlighted them here. One is maximizing our enterprise agility by simplifying and delivering cloud operational model wherever data lives to eliminate that complexity of managing that on-site data premise, on-site data infrastructure. Secondly, we really want to empower the developers, the analysts, the data scientists to unlock the value of data by streamlining access to it and making it secure. Thirdly, we want to integrate that data management throughout the data life cycle across the de test dev, production, your data protection, and your analytics se uh, sectors. Fourth, we want to protect that data wherever it lives, from the edge to the cloud, with simple policy-driven automation to meet any SLA. And then lastly, we want to ensure that the performance and availability for that data and those apps are available without disruption. Wherever you might be, you always have to have access to them. And with that, we call this unified data ops here at Hewlett Packard Enterprise. And we, this is designed to bring a new experience to our customers. So let's jump in. 
Okay, so we're going to break down those silos and really into three core areas, our data centric, our cloud native and our AI driven. So we are reimagining the data management and infrastructure uh, silos and have a bold new vision, a North Star to help you simplify, break down those silos and complexity to accelerate that data driven transformation for your business. This vision is what we call Unified Data Ops. Unified Data Ops reimagines the data experience for our customers into three kind of core areas, as I mentioned. This is an approach that integrates our data-centric policies and automation across the data lifecycle to help simplify data management. Cloud, we also have cloud-native control and operations to bring control away from the underlying infrastructure and deliver the agility of a cloud with storage as a service based on data and infrastructure services. And then lastly, AI-driven insights. Uh, this is going to help you to bring uh, in intelligence to make infrastructure invisible to the cloud. With our unified data ops, you can transform in place wherever your data uh, and wherever your data lives, and it'll simplify the data management, the complexity, and unleash the agility and accelerate innovation. Okay, so let's look at, um, let's look at our answers for this unified data ops. So recognizing our customer you needs for our new data experience, HPE has architected what we call the intelligent data platform. That is designed to bring the cloud experience to data, uh, and deliver unified data services to streamline data management. It powers a new data experience that collapses the silos across people, process, and technology. As you can see here, we've got three kind of core areas. We've got our cloud data services, cloud infrastructure services, and then cloud native data infrastructure. This architecture includes uh, unified cloud data services to manage the life cycle, data across edge to cloud, cloud infrastructure services coupled with cloud native, uh, data infrastructure to deliver cloud operations, and then AI driven intelligence for autonomous operations. It's all delivered as a service experience as customers are demanding that they should subscribe or pay for only what they use without the burden of over provisioning for their dynamic environments. HPE has really taken a leadership role in offering you as a service solutions and a consumption model that to ensure that your customers get what they need when they need it, and they're able to moderate things up or down as their business demands change or continue to change. All right, so let's talk about Data Services Cloud Console. So we've spoken a lot about tackling infrastructure and management challenges. Let's really get down to it and take a quick look at the products that Intelligent Data Platform is built upon. Data Services Cloud Console is our storage as a service console that helps you transform faster with cloud operations and unified data operations as a service. It brings a cloud experience to wherever data lives and a cloud architecture that abstracts and orchestrates orchestrates infrastructure and data workflows, transforming complex data operations into a simplified experience across the clouds. So if you look here, this is our um, data services cloud console. Uh, it is designed to simplify operations with a single destination for a comprehensive set of data and infrastructure services. As you can see from the screen here, you have uh, different options as a service. You can get access, protect, search, you can manage or deploy different services. Currently, it delivers a whole uh, cloud infrastructure services, and it provides really the foundation for us at Hewlett Packard Enterprise to deliver new cloud data services on an ongoing basis in the future. So stay tuned here. This is where we'll continue to put new as a service features as they come out uh, in the future. Okay. You may be wondering about the security implications of connecting to the cloud. We take security, uh, we take security very seriously here on behalf of our customers and ourselves. And that's why we've built Data Services Cloud Console on the cloud technology that underpins Aruba Central. If you're familiar with Aruba Central, it serves millions of de devices connected across 90,000 customers and cus clusters deployed around the world. Data Services Cloud Console ensures the secure management of global infrastructure and data services with multi-level advanced security capabilities that include encrypted connectivity to assets uh, throughout certificates, tunnels, multi-factor authentication, um, all throughout 
uh, role-based access control policies. And so security is taken care of. And we, again, we're building it off a proven technology that we already use for millions of devices out there today. So let's take a look at some very specific um, applications that, or as a service that we have out there that is available today for customers to use. So HPE is answering your call, our customer's call, with the introduction of next generation data protection as a service with HPE GreenLake. Inside of that, with our data services cloud console, we have Zerto, an HPE company now, that offers best in class disaster recovery with ability to recover in minutes to state uh, to a state seconds prior to a ransomware attack. Data protection services with HPE GreenLake delivers true edge to cloud data protection designed uh, to protect your data for every SLA. This provides cloud consumption and experiences across the spectrum, from, spectrum from disaster recovery to backup as well as archive. Every facet of data protection is offered as a service throughout HPE GreenLake. These services deliver every SLA from rapid recovery to ransomware protection to long-term data retention, either on-premise or in the cloud, along with operational simplicity. Customers have the flexibility to modernize their data protection and meet every SLA at the right stage of data, data lifecycle at the right cost. Okay, so let's talk about uh, one of the very first offerings that we have here, which is Zerto, a company that we just here recently required. Zerto's best-in-class talent and technology expands HPE's data management and disaster recovery capabilities, giving customers the ability to protect their data and recover in minutes from ransomware attacks. We're thrilled to welcome Zerto to the HPE family together with these uh, together with these, we will accelerate innovation and scale offerings to our customers and protect their data from edge to cloud. Uh, as you can see here, uh, Zerto uses a journal-based recovery, and it's perfect for customers that are looking to do replication either to the cloud or uh, to another location. Uh, so we have uh, Zerto is perfect for that disaster recovery. And again, that journaling that goes out for 30 days uh, in the Zerto uh, architecture. Another uh, service that we have in Data Center Cloud, Data Services Cloud Console, is our HPE Backup and Recovery Service. This is brand new as we just developed it as a service uh, designed for hybrid cloud, cloud, providing cloud experience wherever your data lives. Again, don't have to buy the software, you're just buying as a service. This service is engineered as a cloud native service delivered through Data Services Cloud Console. It is initially available to protect VM workloads deployed on HPE Electra 6000 or 9000. More applications, workloads, and platforms will be re released in future, uh, future releases. But just know with Data Services Cloud Console, we'll continue to add new services on there where customers are able to go out, select what services that they need, and then uh, purchase those. That allows those customers to only buy what they need. And then with that, they would then uh, only pay for what they need. And as their uses goes up or down, the cost associated with it also goes up or down. Okay, so as we wrap up here, we've talked an awful lot about Data Services Cloud Console. Now let's watch a short demonstration to get a better understanding of how it can help your environment. Hello, my name is Matt with the Cloud Data Services team, and welcome to the Data Services Cloud Console. Join me as we take a look. Using single sign-on, we're gonna log into the portal. We can configure multi-factor authentication as well if we need to. And if we have multiple organizations to log in, we can choose those here as well. We will use Matco today. Once logged in, this is where I would manage security and applications of my environment. Let's manage our account details first, and we'll look at the applications in a second. So here we have our account details, users, roles, assignments, and device management. I have a managed services partner that needs read-only access to my environment. Let's say they want to be able to analyze what I'm using to see if I need more. I set up an account for them in my portal. From there, I'll give an assignment. And this assignment is what gives the read-only access so they're able to log in and only perform the functions that I want them to be able to perform. So we'll check read-only and click add. Now we'll add a scope. And a scope is what resources it can have access to. So once we click on add scope, we click the region that it should have access to and here is we select all the scopes within my data services cloud console that my read-only user will have access to. 
and we'll go and check all of them because I want them to be able to see everything in the data services cloud console. And just like that, we've locked down what this user can do and what they have access to. Now let's explore the data services cloud console environment. We've added the application to the environment already. We'll navigate to the region where the application was deployed. As you see, we have global regions. We're in US West. We'll click on the data services cloud console and go explore our environment. We're presented with four options, our data ops manager, the info site portal, intent-based provisioning, and audit. Audit is a great feature. It shows us everything that has happened in our environment. Launching audit gives us an easy view of activity across the entire estate of our fleet, giving us a single pane of glass to view any issues or any activity within our entire estate. Going back to the main page of the Data Services Cloud Console, we'll now turn our focus to Data Ops Manager. Data Ops Manager is a fully programmable cloud-like experience that lets you manage your fleet at scale. When first logging in, you're presented with a dashboard that gives you a view of both the capacity and performance of systems and volumes. You're also presented with any issues that might be happening across your entire state. From here, we can go and look at our individual systems. Let's drill down into the HPE Electra 9080. From here, we can take a deeper look into the array or change any settings that we may need to. Data access is where we provision hosts and host groups. This plays an important part into our intent-based provisioning. Volumes is where our intent-based provisioning lives. Intent-based provisioning makes it super easy to provision storage for your entire fleet. With just four simple questions, we can provision any type of workload you need. You select what type of workload, how many volumes you want to create, how much storage do you need on each volume, and which host should have access. Once we answer those questions and click continue, the intelligence built into the intent-based provisioning will choose the best location for your workload. If you don't like what you see, you can choose another array, or you can just stick with the recommendations and click continue. Now we can customize our volume by giving it a name and setting any other options according to that volume that we need to. And that's it, nothing else. We can submit that and the volume's been created and attached to the host. Once the volume's created, Data Ops Manager makes it super easy to be able to search for it. Just start typing in the letters of the volume and it'll come right up. An additional feature that I personally like is the integrated help in technical articles. Technical articles enables you to have on-screen help should you need any assistance. Simply go to technical articles and type in the subject that you need help with. For instance, if we need help provisioning a volume, we just start to type volumes and it will find you the help needed. Finally, we have tasks. Tasks gives you a rendering of what's going on in your environment, what's been created, who created it, and at what time it was created, allowing you to track anything that's happened among all your arrays. Thank you for watching our walkthrough. For more information about Data Services Cloud Console, go to hpe.com storage slash DSCC. All right, hopefully you enjoyed that demonstration. Now let's open it up for some questions. All right, excellent presentation, really cool demo. Thank you so much, Ryan. I appreciate that. I've just brought up a poll question for everyone out there in the audience. Uh, the question on the screen says, what are the next steps that HPE can help you with on your digital transformation journey? And perhaps you'd like to participate in a digital transformation workshop uh, perhaps a conversation, short conversation to chat about, you know, your digital transformation future there at your public sector organization. Uh, perhaps there's case studies or a proof of concept that could be done. So uh, we appreciate your feedback there on the poll and we'll take your questions uh, while you respond to the poll. So uh, let's see, first question for you. I just wanted to ask this one. I think this is a great one here, Ryan, to start with, and that is, why should public sector organizations pivot to as-a-service offerings? Yeah, absolutely. So, hey, thank you for the question. That's great. Um, so, the big thing here is really is HPE, why we are tr we're, we're pivoting to as-a-service is really to kind of meet the needs of what our customers. Today, many customers see the 
flexibility and ease of use of cloud infrastructure, but they're worried about maybe that security. They want that on-premise uh, performance. And so here at Hewlett Packard Enterprise, we're meeting you halfway where we're keeping that hardware and infrastructure on premise or maybe in a colo location. So you have that performance and security that you basically can control that. But yet we're giving you that cloud like experience when it comes to uh, consumption and how you want to purchase that, whether that uh, that consumption goes up each month or down each month. And we're giving you choices uh, and as a service. So giving you really that flexibility in what your offerings are and then secondarily um, secondarily, and then how much you pay each month depending on how much you use, just like a cloud, if you will. Nice, nice. I, I like that flexibility, that scalability, agility. I know that uh, public sector organizations really need. Uh, let's see, here's another question they're asking. Do you have to purchase HPE storage products through as a service? Yeah, so today, and this question has come up a couple of times here now, but today, yes, you do have to purchase one of our HPE storage Electro arrays. That is our Electro 9000 or 6000. Uh, if you purchase one of those arrays, then DSCC, DSCC comes along with that. And uh, then you can have full access to uh, all of those different um, all of those different uh, as a service offerings that are out there. Uh, in the future, today, those as a service offerings are Hewlett Packard Enterprise intellectual property, but we will be opening that up. Uh, to offer some of our partners with us. And so we have many different ISV partners that we have today that, uh, that we resell and that we partner with. And some of those will now start to be in, uh, give, it, give it some time here on the roadmap, but some of those will start to come into uh, the DSCC console. And then you'll have the ability to go in through that, pick some either Hewlett Packard technologies or even some of our partner technologies. Very nice, very nice. And then let's see, another question here. Uh, what products do you currently have? in your asset service offerings at HPE? Yep, so um, DSCC is just starting off, but we do already have a handful of products in DSCC. Uh, first and foremost is that you're able to manage those arrays, so whether that's Electra 9000 or 6000 from a cloud console, you can go in and manage your array and um, uh, do all the provisioning, and everything that you would need to do for that array. That's the first item. We also now have two new items that came out just before Christmas time, but that is our backup and recovery service that is available today as a service, and then our disaster recovery as a service, which is based off of Zerto. Uh, as you, uh, many of you may know, we purchased Zerto in the last year. We have already integrated that into DSCC, so you can go in and pick either a backup and recovery service or disaster recovery as a service. Those are the, the first offerings on our as a service. Very nice, very nice. Um, let's see. I'm afraid we're running out of time here in our live Q&A, but uh, there's a lot more really great questions here for you in the electronic queue. Ryan, uh, maybe you can get back to some of those folks. They've got some great questions as well. Um, but really excellent presentation. And again, we enjoyed seeing the demo uh, of this new product from HPE. So thank you so much for being on the Ecocast. Thank you. And of course, for more information on uh, the HPE as a service offerings, check out the link. It's right there in your handouts tab of the audience console. That'll take you to hpe.com slash storage slash data services cloud console. And you can learn about the new data services cloud console offering from HPE. So make sure that you check that out. All right, if you haven't answered the poll question, now's the time to do so because we're about to move on to our next presentation here on the Ecocast. But first, I do want to announce the winner of our next Amazon $500 gift card. This is going to Dennis Al, I believe is how you say it, A-H-L, from Nebraska. Dennis Al from Nebraska. One more Amazon $500 gift card coming up after our next presentation. And of course, don't forget about our best question prizes as well. All right, and with that, I'm excited now to bring in our next presenter on today's Ecocast. Welcome to Jeremiah Cox, Global Cloud Architect at NetApp. Jeremiah, it's great to have you on. Thank you, I'm, I enjoy being here. I'm looking forward to today's conversation. Absolutely, well, take it away. So, hello. Uh, I usually say good day anymore because we're all globally spread, uh, but welcome to this, this session on how NetApp unlocks the best of cloud. 
what's prohibiting most people these days from uh, faster cloud adoption? You know, in my opinion, it's largely been about the data. Moving, the, moving data to the cloud has challenges. It's hard to move, manage, it's hard to back up, protect, archive, and of course, none of those challenges really go away when moving to cloud. If you think about data growth over the last 30 years, we've gone from measuring data in gigabytes to now petabytes as the common capacity nomenclature. And data has mass and gravity associated with it when you consider how to move petabyte scale to cloud. It has become an anchor weighing down some of our largest customers when trying to move it around and manage it. And also performance and reliability. On-prem customers are accustomed to six nines of availability, multi-site configuration. So reliability of data is of concern when moving to an infrastructure model that you don't necessarily own. When focused on workloads, these are the three themes we see most often. Cost, moving the workloads themselves, and of course the skill sets gap when leveraging new services. Everyone I talk to wants to look at how they can reduce their cost, or at least I I have yet to meet a customer who says they are happy with their storage bill. This is a, a constant problem we find not just limited to cloud, but the data center as well. Things like service transparency, cost and accounting, the ability to do detailed chargeback and analysis of services. All of those end up playing at an infrastructure and service level, and it's an area that we have a history of being able to differentiate and help our customers. Within migration of data and workloads, you know, say this is usually the one that's counterintuitive to most people, which is why would a storage company want to help me move to the cloud faster? Surely you would want me to continue buying storage arrays. And the reality is we look at this as a tremendous opportunity with the migration of applications and app modernization we feel we can deliver value and we can help our customers. And of course, helping our customers is good for NetApp. And we have services designed to easily move data from legacy third-party on-prem platforms as well. Organizations may need to modernize applications, acquire new knowledge, update policies. This makes cloud journey slow, expensive, and typically complex. But there's, there's an opportunity here. Um, you can get the freedom to run traditional cloud native applications and traditional applications and move them across the hybrid multi-cloud without redesigning your code, your processes, or your teams. Harness cloud advantages faster at lower costs and get peace of mind knowing that your data is always available, secure, and compliant. It's interesting to look at where we are versus where we have come from. NetApp at its genesis has been the original software-defined storage provider. As a company, we started in the early 90s with the idea that we would deliver our software on largely agnostic hardware platforms that customers could source themselves. But over time, and especially in the early 90s, customers required faster, more robust, and enterprise-class hardware ultimately leading us to selling purpose-built engineered storage solutions and becoming known as a hardware company. But in our DNA, in our core, it's all about software and how we deliver value. NetApp's focus on the cloud began almost a decade ago when we partnered with AWS to help drive cloud services. At the core is our ONTAP operating system, which is how we deliver our intellectual product. We've adopted an ONTAP Anywhere concept, making it available in a backpack, at the edge, core, and cloud. And this enables us to help our customers meet more cloud mandates for hybrid and cloud native workloads with either a fully managed storage service or a self-directed storage service, delivering the freedom to run Linux and Windows applications natively across the hybrid AWS cloud without having to redesign your code, your processes, or your teams. So what makes shared files so
so important in the cloud? No, if you ask me, I say it's because we won. We won the battle of block versus NAS. Although we still support both. You, you remember the, the battle was block is faster, block is more reliable, I want my LUNs, but file is easier, it's more efficient, it's more portable, it's easy to back up, use, and maintain. I say we won because how do you do LUNs, HBAs, and fiber channel switches in the cloud? Exactly, right? There are some options. Like I said, we still support iSCSI, but there are challenges. We are seeing shared files explode, mostly due to unstructured data, such as user home drives, backups, departmental shares, application data, with IDC predicting 80% of data will be unstructured within the next three years. And 74% of file-based apps are candidates to move to the cloud today. The why is due to the previous fight between Block and NAS. Moving file-based apps requires an IP address and a NAS protocol. That's it. Right? It, it's a mount point, and your app can use it. It's universal, NFS, or SMB. It will be interesting to know to see if IDC's prediction of almost 60% of organizations being mostly cloud within the next 18 months. But to think of it, I can't recall the last time I had a customer that was still running something like Exchange on-prem. So first, cloud volumes on tap. This is what we've had for years in AWS. It is our on-tap storage operating system running in AWS. It leverages all flavors of EBS as disk that we build our aggregates from, just like our on-prem hardware systems do. We leverage EC2 compute to run our operating system with multiple options based on capacity and performance requirements, but all with the cloud flexibility to change any of those variables uh, as, as needs to dictate. And then from there, we provision volumes and LUNs served over NFS, SMB, or iSCSI. By innovating within the software layer, we've made our data management capabilities highly portable. For current NetApp customers, the features listed on the right hand of this side of this slide are, are probably fairly familiar. And we talk about data recovery, data efficiencies, protocols, replication, all of those things require absolutely no hardware because they are all delivered as part of the ONTAP operating system as a software feature. And this even includes our replication capability. SnapMirror. It's our block-based replication technology used to replicate data between ONTAP systems and is a software to feature delivered by the OS. And that's any ONTAP system, Cloud Volumes ONTAP and AWS and AWS GovCloud, C2S, our on-prem ONTAP systems. Again, we innovate at the software layer. Even high availability, leveraging AWS services and deploying CBO within those services allows for us to be deployed across two availability zones with synchronous data replication between storage nodes, resulting in zero data loss and an automated storage failover between availability zones. So our ubiquitous data experience offers a unified platform, and that's even further amplified by our NetApp Cloud Manager. This is an advanced control plane that extends management and secure multi-tenancy multi capabilities securely as a service through the AWS Marketplace. In addition, Cloud Manager also allows you to manage your Cloud Volumes infrastructure simply as code. So that becomes a, a heterogeneous automation layer that you can tap into and use for your data fabric. We want to enable the flexibility to use whatever makes sense with the idea that you can have the same storage features in AWS and on-prem, and we can deliver that in a way that makes sense from a framework perspective for you. What if all of that sounds great, but you don't want to manage it? And that's where Amazon FSX for NetApp ONTAP comes into play. FSXN is a fully managed storage service. 
complete cloud storage service built on ONTAP. Amazon FSx for ONTAP is built for companies that don't have cycles to worry about setting up and provisioning file servers and storage volumes or replicating data, installing file server software updates and patches and managing failover and failback and manually performing backups. That is a tr tremendous amount of administrative overhead that we have simply taken off your plate. And this is a full featured on tap storage as a native AWS managed service and you lose nothing from a functionality perspective. That is an AWS product sold by AWS, supported by AWS, built and fully managed by AWS. So it allows you to easily extend to the cloud, migrate workloads, build modern apps, eliminate management overhead with integration of the complete NetApp portfolio. It offers support for multiple gigabits of throughput, over 100,000 IOPS, and sub-millisecond latency, concurrent multi-protocol access, automatic data tiering to lower storage costs based off, based off of storage access patterns, data replication, snapshots, caching, cloning capabilities, encryption at rest and in transit, integration with software for antivirus and auditing, active directory for identity-based management. And the use cases are similar to what we've kind of already discussed. You know, all the things we discussed earlier, enterprise-grade file shares, apps and databases, software development, data protection, disaster recovery to the cloud, hybrid cloud enablement. I like to say that FSX for ONTAP has a bi-directional user interface, if you will, meaning for our AWS-centric customers, you can continue to access everything from the familiar AWS console as well as the AWS API. And those that are familiar with ONTAP can access it from Cloud Manager. And through Cloud Manager, you have access to everything else that is great about the ONTAP ecosystem, including the Cloud Manager, we're extending those APIs so we can do additional volume creation and replication and capacity management and more, or leveraging something like Cloud Insights, which provides advanced performance monitoring, Spot Ocean, which supports FSx to prevent end-to-end -end automated and optimized container infrastructure. We can leverage Cloud Sync and Cloud Data Sense to move and migrate from legacy third-party systems as well as provide compliance and data scanning for things like PII and GDPR. We can leverage global file cache for our global file share file systems with global file locking. And of course, our Snap Center uh, capabilities around application integrated snapshots. It also can serve as a primary storage for stateful Kubernetes applications running on Amazon EKS and Red Hat OpenShift on AWS using NetApp's Astra Trident Dynamic Storage Provider. What about the other elephant when we start talking about data that's always in the room, the one that's making headlines, well, almost weekly? Um, the reality is that everyone is accountable for their data wherever it lives. Unfortunately, there is no free pass for having data in the public cloud and having some form of a security issue. The challenge becomes providing these services with a level of protection that the enterprise expects, but in the cloud. Now, let's face it, it's not a matter of if, but most likely when a ransomware attack will affect you. At the end of the day, criminals are simply targeting data. They either want to steal it, expose it, or prevent you from using it. Having the right solutions are critical into ensuring your data is protected, that you can detect threats and recover quickly from an attack. As a leader in data management solutions, protection and security are built into our DNA. Our storage solutions built on ONTAP, again, whether that's FSXN, that's CVO, or on-prem systems, provide the most comprehensive security capabilities that help you protect and secure your data with the ability to rapidly recover data in the event of attack, block malicious data before it's written to disk, and create immutable and intelligible storage volumes to prevent infection or deletion. A portfolio of AI and machine learning powered monitoring 
and reporting technologies help to identify these threats before they create an impact. And intelligent logs and reporting help provide comprehensive forensics to identify the source of the threat. The cost of ransomware involves more than just a potential payment. And organizations of all size are annually paying for cyber insurance to protect against the impact of ransom attacks, and the premiums are only going to go up. The average cost of ransomware was expect, estimated in 2021 to be over $1.8 I, I imagine that is very much on the low end of the spectrum, which even though it, it by itself is, is a double from 2020. So the ransomware recovery costs you know, typically involved consider the rebuild time of infrastructure, servers, workstations, the determining factor in time of whether to pay the ransom or not, and then, of course, the, the downtime incurred during that entire process. And it's not just the private sector, right? Criminals are after the public sector as well. So the foundation of a secure data management environment begins with the right storage. ONTAP offers native capabilities designed to prevent malicious data from infecting file systems while also being able to detect abnormal behavior. Our snapshot-based data protection features enable fast restore of data to get you back in business quickly. And the protection begins with our zero trust engine powered by F-Policy. F-Policy offers protection and detection capabilities that include the ability to screen for malicious files, as well as provide advanced functionality for user behavior analytics. Now that snapshot copies are immutable and are an efficient and powerful defense against ransomware attacks. When you combine the efficient, that with efficient snap mirror replication, you can now place copies of your data at another ONTAP device or S3 compatible object storage for an additional layer of protection. And you can restore this data in seconds in order to recover from data corruption, virus attacks, or of course, ransomware. NetApp SnapLock is a feature, again, software-based of ONTAP, that provides worm file locking as a defense against ransomware by providing a logical air gap to thwart hackers from being able to delete backup copies. And with the latest release of ONTAP, we have added machine learning to monitor abnormal file system behavior to detect possible attacks directly from the storage operating system. And if ONTAP detects an attack, it will create a snapshot immediately and then alert admins of the threat. This capability complements our Cloud Insights user behavior analysis as well as other alerts to other storage indicators that might indicate an infection or attack, such as a rapidly decreasing storage efficiency ratio or a ginormous spike in snapshot reserve growth. And finally, our tools and partnerships provide intelligence to help you apply file level forensics to identify the source of the threat and then hopefully eliminate future problems. Some of the success that we've had specifically within public sector and SLED, you know, VDI uh, was something that was brought to the forefront of cloud use cases very early in COVID for the, for the obvious reason. Everyone had to go home and we all had to still figure out how to get business done. The VDI is, is one of those uh, spotlight applications, if you will, that once you dissect it, you understand that VDI is not an application unto itself. It's more of a service delivery engine because VDI encompasses a desktop, obviously, with operating system, but it requires applications and application data access, user files, shared files and department shares, and then security and backup and replication and management all sitting on top of that to make VDI a reality. Other customers are trying to meet imposed cloud mandates. And again, the easiest and fastest way into the cloud is by not having to refactor and retransform how you do business today. Those things will happen naturally as, as part of cloud uh, adoption. But if I need to get in the cloud now, I need to be able to continue doing that, 
how I've done business on-prem with the same skill sets and the same people and the same scripts and the same application and management that I've had over data. So having ONTAP in both places for some of these customers has made this a no-brainer. I've had one customer that moved 400 applications to the cloud in less than nine months based on that principle alone with ONTAP. And then, of course, the deferring of on-prem expansion. We're not ready to dive into the cloud head first yet, but we also don't want to continue buying on-prem or we want to defer on-prem CapEx expenditure. We can easily migrate data to the cloud, leveraging NFS, FSx for NetApp ONTAP or CVO, or even some of our fabric pool technologies of moving data into S3 from on-prem systems. So that's a small snippet of really where we are in the cloud today and what our capabilities and how they extend. It's never about a single application or a single workload. It's about the rest of the entire enterprise ecosystem required to make those a reality in the cloud, again, with the enterprise capabilities that are still required to manage and run these workloads in the cloud today. I do appreciate your time today. I hope this has been valuable. I think we have a few minutes for some poll questions, if, that's, if I understand correctly. Absolutely, Jeremiah, we do. Uh, we have some great questions coming in from the audience. And while we do that, I'm just going to bring up a poll for everyone out there. The poll is on the screen and says, what additional information would you like about NetApp? So, uh, so let's see, some great questions coming in, Jeremiah, for you. First one here I see, I'll just start with this one from Rob. Uh, who's asking, does NetApp help storage managers which files are most used stay on-prem versus migrate to the cloud based on access or uh, change rates? Absolutely. And that, that fabric pool technology that we were talking about, which is a, a technology that's, that's also implemented into FSX for NetApp ONTAP and CVO, is looking at volumes from a data access perspective. And that's a... It's, a policy that you can set at that layer that says, perfect example, SIF shares, if users haven't touched their files in, say, 63 days, move that off of my Tier 1 highly expensive fast storage and over into S3 so I can pay $0.02 cents a gig for that data instead. But when the data needs to come back based off of user access behavior, there's nothing from an administrative perspective to be done. The system will manage that data movement seamlessly under the covers so that neither end user nor application really has an idea where their data is, but nor do they experience any change in how they use and consume data. Very nice. Yeah, it sounds like that could help a lot with scalability and also, you know, potentially cost savings as well. Um, another question here, how does NetApp manage cloud storage costs, especially when there may be primary, secondary, or different cloud storage based on RTO and RPO requirements? The cost would typically be determined by the type of performance and or capacity metrics. Um, so I mentioned in the beginning with CVO, we can leverage all four flavors of EBS. So that allows our customers to construct aggregates for CVO, just like they have for on-prem systems where they may have some capacity made up of very cheap SATA disks. They may have some made up of very flash, uh, very fast flash uh, IO2 type disk as an example in the cloud and you can have multiple of those containers of storage attached to one or more CVO systems so that you can place data you know, based off of um, the, the best metric uh, from a utilization perspective. But then you wrap all of that into a high availability deployment that seamlessly and synchronously replicates data from one availability zone to the other, wrapping that all within an HA framework while still allowing you to place data where it makes the most sense from a performance and cost perspective. Nice. Nice. I like that. And then another question here they're asking, um, what are NetApp's plans to consolidate their management tools and provide true AI-driven analytics for the future? For the future? Well, I don't know that I can really comment on futures on a webcast, but um, I, I think if you look at what we are doing with Cloud Manager today, um, that has truly become our single source of truth and management plane for everything that we're doing in the cloud, and, and of course a number of products that we didn't speak about today. Um, not only is that our, our management plane, but it's also our automation endpoint. 
so that customers can leverage one API or a set of API rather, or whether you prefer, prefer to do that with Ansible books or Terraform, Terraform calling Ansible books, or just the basics of REST API to allow for a, a true automation layer uh, as a single endpoint for everything within the NetApp Cloud ecosystem. Um, from a AI and ML perspective, we leverage that today with a product called Cloud Secure, which is how we do the user behavior and analytics uh, to prevent against, uh, against um, ransomware. Nice, nice. I like that. Um, next question, can I use NetApp to get my data to the cloud even if I don't have NetApp hardware on-premises? Absolutely. It, it's, you know, we have a, a rich history of, of helping customers migrate data from you know, different third-party systems, um, even from uh, object stores and, and a number of other unstructured, uh, non-POSIX-based um, systems. Uh, and how we do that is based on professional services, so it very much depends on where you're coming from and where you want to go, uh, but we, we've got a deep bench of experience for that. Nice. Um, it looks like that's, that's all the time we have, I'm afraid, in our live Q&A slot here. There's a number of more technical questions. Maybe you can get back to some of these folks after the event, Jeremiah, but um, really great presentation, and it's uh, really excellent to have you on the event today. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Appreciate you having us. For more information on NetApp, check out the handout. It's there in your audience console. It covers uh, the uh, – it's a actually a paper from uh, ESG, the Enterprise Strategy Group, that covers uh, Amazon FSX for NetApp on tap, tailored for the demands of enterprise applications. It uh, looks like a very well-done resource. Make sure that you download that. And, of course, visit uh, cloud.netapp.com. Uh, for more information on the NetApp solutions. And, of course, we appreciate your feedback there still on the poll question. If you haven't responded yet to the poll, we encourage you to do that. I'll just leave it up while I announce our final gift card winner. This Amazon $500 gift card is going to Chris Perthel from Illinois. Congratulations, Chris Perthel from Illinois. All right, it's now time to wrap up today's EcoCast event. Uh, before you go, I want to remind you to subscribe to the Actual Tech Media podcast over in the iTunes store. If you are a potential presenter or sponsor of an upcoming EcoCast or Megacast event, reach out to us at connect at actualtechmedia.com. And then I hope that you will join us on our event on Thursday, where we'll cover uh, in cloud we trust, ensuring trust and security in enterprise IT and the cloud. This is a big megacast event, uh, seven expert presenters back to back. Of course, we always have awesome prizes and presenters on the megacast. So hope to see you there this Thursday, starting at noon Eastern time. If you don't have an invitation to that, if it's not on your calendar, visit events.actualtechmedia.com and you can register right there in our events center. All right. Well, thank you to everyone who joined us on today's EcoCast on transforming education and government IT and cloud environments. I hope that you learned a lot, and I hope that you have a great day. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.